Okay, uh, on behalf of the three members of the authority, I'd like to officially call this meeting of the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority to order and welcome everybody in the audience here uh, in attendance here today. Appreciate you all being here. I'm Mike Nystrom. I'm the chairman of the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority. And uh, to start out today, um, we will uh, go through a couple of ground rules that we're going to lay out. First of all, our meeting is scheduled from 10 a.m. until uh, 3 p.m. Uh, we plan to take one short break, approximately 20 to 30 minutes, somewhere around noon, if needed. If we get through the meeting, we'll keep plowing forward. Um, I'll start out by addressing public comment here today. We will have a, a full public comment period at the end of our meeting here today, after our business period. Um, there will be a one-time speaking opportunity for anyone who fills out a card. The cards are out there on the table. We ask you to fill out a card, uh, put it in the basket. We'll be collecting those. Uh, we aren't doing them in any particular order. Whatever order they come out in, they'll be brought up here. I'll uh, call them out one by one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for the next speaker to be up here and then have someone on deck as well so that we aren't waiting for folks to walk up to the podium each and every time. So I will call out two names. When you hear your name, come on up and stand by the podium. The person that's next in line to speak will walk up to the microphone, the other person will stand behind them, and so on. Uh, we will uh, do our very best to get through every public comment today. Uh, we think it's very important uh, to hear from everyone. Um, I'm going to keep time on my phone. There is a three-minute maximum per speaker. When you have 15 seconds left, I will simply let you know in a very respectful way that you have 15 seconds left. We ask that everybody be respectful in their comments. I know this is an emotional issue to some folks, um, but uh, we want to allow everyone the opportunity to speak here today, and so I feel that that's very important. The other thing that I want to make sure everyone understands is this is not a question and answer period when you come up to the podium. We are not here to answer questions for you. We are here to take your statements. Uh, we'll take them under advisement. If you have some form of a question that we can look into for you, we'll be happy to look into that. But we are not here to have a Q&A session. Um, so with that, um, we will move on. Uh, first of all, I would ask uh, the authority members, uh, the agenda was sent out uh, with the public notice on February 18th. Uh, do I have a motion to s approve that agenda? So moved. And a second. All right. Uh, with that, we have a, a, the agenda is approved. Uh, next in line, um, the uh, the minutes from the December 19, 2018 meeting um, uh, are before us for approval. But before we do that, I want to just kind of walk through them. Um, the tunnel agreement was signed by the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority at that meeting on December 19, 2018. Uh, the MSCA signed it on behalf of the state along with Enbridge. Um, and then contracts were approved at that meeting as well for two techni technical support consultants, Dr. Michael Mooney for the tunnel and then Dan Larson with HT Engineering for the pipeline. For the public to understand, uh, we will be referring to that tunnel agreement several times during this meeting. It's already approved, so it's not up for debate. Um, and then those consultants throughout our meeting as well, and oftentimes into the future. So with that, uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Approve. A motion, yes. Second. All right, with that, the uh, uh, all those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Uh, no. Uh, is there any old business before us? I, I have none. Nothing. Okay. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to give just a quick summary, if I could, of uh, the Line 5 replacement tunnel project. Public Act 359 of 2018 requires that the authority act as the state's representative in overseeing the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of a utility corridor under the Straits of Mackinac. 
Based on the agreement Enbridge Energy has agreed to uh, for the design, construction, and maintenance of this uh, multi-utility multi tunnel, uh, ultimately this, this facility will house Line 5. Once complete, Enbridge will transfer ownership of this tunnel to the authority, and at that time, a process will be set in motion to shut down line five, the, the Line 5 pipelines that currently sit on the bottom of the straits. So, um, there have been numerous thresholds that were set out in the tunnel agreement, which includes several action items. Uh, so to walk us through these type of uh, items that are in the tunnel agreement, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Michael Mooney, our tunnel consultant, to the podium uh, to give us an overview. As the doctor makes his way over, I would like to take a moment to point out what an expert we have representing us uh, as the authority. Mike Mooney comes to us from the Colorado School of Mines and is considered a world-renowned expert in the area of tunnels. In my, in my research, I'm not sure that we, could have ha that we could have hoped for a better individual to represent us as, as the authority. So with that, welcome, Dr. Mooney. Thank you, Chairman Nystrom. Um, good morning, everybody. I'd like to give an update on uh, progress on the tunnel agreement. Uh, what I will do is talk through, there's been six deliverables uh, provided to date per the agreement by Enbridge. And I'll walk, through, walk you through five of those, one of them which regarding escrow accounts I'll leave to a colleague. So I'll start with the first deliverable which is called the Preliminary Engineering Activities Work Plan. I should mention this is in your packet of information, my report. The first deliverable is the Preliminary Engineering Activities Work Plan. This is required per Tunnel Agreement Section 7.1 and was submitted in February of 2019. This work plan describes all the engineering activities that will be performed up to and through the development of the request for proposals for design or design construct of the tunnel. This document, this work plan, describes the following key activities. The first one is the geotechnical investigations. So this includes the, the desktop study, the lake bottom profiling, geophysical surveys, gathering of geotechnical subsurface data along the proposed tunnel corridor through a boring in situ testing and laboratory testing program. This involves the development of a geotechnical data report, which is a compilation, a factual compilation of all the information collected during the geotechnical investigations. This involves initiating what's called a geotechnical baseline report, which describes the anticipated or so-called baseline conditions along the tunnel alignment it involves the initiation of risk assessment, risk management process, which is conducted on all tunnel projects, assembling of a project specifications team and beginning to develop or the beginning of project specifications development. Also gathering information that would provide input to the re regulatory uh, permit applications and then further refining tunnel aspects. If you recall, there was a pretty comprehensive feasibility study that was done up until the agreement time. Taking that forward is preliminary engineering. So in my review of that, I find that the, the uh, work plan submitted by Enbridge to be satisfactory and in accordance with standard practice for preliminary engineering required for the Straits Tunnel. Can I answer any questions about item one? I, it's, uh, I do have a, some questions. In the, in the history of the development of, of the, of the uh, tunnel, uh, I, I just wanted to make it, everyone understand that you were to be a consultant to the, the, the tunnel authority, I believe, right from the beginning, but uh, because of some issues, uh, the tunnel authority really hasn't been involved for the last year and a half. Has that compromised in any way your review of the geotechnical is, uh, issues on the tunnel? Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, ex absolutely not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mike, so 
simply put, the geotechnical analysis has been done now to date? The data collected, the geotechnical site investigation, all that data has been collected, and I'll get to that. That's one of the submittal items or deliverables, the geotechnical data report. Uh, so yes, that was completed throughout the calendar year 2019. Is, is there data that will be shared or is that uh, something that's down the road? Uh, what was the outcome of that review? Is, is there information that is uh, helpful to us here today in any way that, that you might share? Well, sure. I, I think it's, it's a, it's a 2,600 plus page report of, for me, exhilarating information about the ground conditions. <laughs> for most others, I've learned not so much. Sure. <clears throat> um, but in general, yes, there's tremendous detail there that, that will be used by the tunnel designer uh, to and the tunnel construction services contractor to develop a plan and design the tunnel. So it's the it's the backbone of this of this project. I can say that the ground conditions include um, competent soil, competent rock through which the tunnel will be will be created. Ground conditions that are within the realm of very successful tunnels that have been constructed worldwide. There's no surprises then that you guys saw. I call it statistically homogeneous. <laughs> That's not a word, but I like it. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the, the professor and me would want to debate you, but I'll, well, I'll leave that. I'm a you, but I can make words. <laughs> yeah. But you didn't find any surprises. I would throw anything off. No, it's it's yeah. It's it's there's it's which which, which sorry. It's within the realm of 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 ground that's been tunneled through successfully. Um, so so in that regard, yes, no no real surprises. And no unique risks. No unique risks that haven't been encountered before in tunnel projects okay. that have been successfully constructed around the world. All right. Uh, any other questions, gentlemen? So with that, uh, uh, can I get a motion to accept the recommendation from our consultant? I so move. I'll second that. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, Mike. Okay, so deliverable number two <clears throat> is to identify a project specifications development team. So this is required per tunnel agreement section 7.2, um, no later than March 1, 2019, and that was submitted on time. Enbridge and the authority were to identify members of a team to jointly develop the project specifications related to design and construction of the tunnel. And just so, so you understand, project specifications essentially are the technical requirements um, from which the constructor builds the tunnel. So these are issues like the thickness of the concrete liner, uh, the durability requirements of the concrete, the strength of the concrete, those kind of elements, very detailed list of, of technical requirements. Um, so on, on Feb 28, 2019, Enbridge submitted a document identifying members of a team from both Enbridge and the authority to jointly develop those specifications. The identified members of the project team include Enbridge's project manager, Amber Pasteur, who is here, and engineering expert, Aaron Dennis. Enbridge's owner's engineer, and they've since hired a very reputable company, WSP, that does a major, major infrastructure project design and has tremendous experience in tunnel uh, design as their, their owner's engineer, Enbridge's operations and maintenance experts. And then on the authority side, <clears throat> myself as a tunnel uh, subject matter expert and Dan Cooper as a pipeline subject matter expert will sit on that, that team, as well as individuals from uh, the state of Michigan, sorry, the Michigan DOT. So this is a construction project. There's great wealth of expertise within MDOT and, and uh, individuals from MDOT will participate on this jointly developed uh, project specifications team. So that process is underway of, of getting the MDOT folks involved. Um, Enbridge's selected design engineer will also participate in that process. An initial list of project specifications, I'll call them preliminary project specifications, were provided in the, in the RFPs that I'll describe 
uh, shortly. That'll be item four or deliverable four. And the development of the final project specifications will be conducted through a joint effort throughout the year 2020. So I find this is the appropriate group of individuals, both for the authority and for the overall project to be successful to jointly develop the full project specifications. So Mike, uh, a couple questions. Um, is, is there a recognition, I mean, everyone focuses on line five. Is there recognition in this, this joint team uh, to consider other utilities in the future then in, in the design of the tunnel? Yes, yes, this is, a, is considered a utility tunnel. And so it will have um, uh, specifications that allow for additional utilities uh, to go through the tunnel. So for example, broadband, uh, high voltage electrical. Uh, and so as the project specification team moves forward, that will be considered um, uh, as part of those technical requirements for, for this tunnel. To be able to accommodate that, uh, as you know, per the agreement, it allows for third party utilities to in the future or now to uh, express an interest in participating and putting their, their services through the tunnel. Uh, maybe this question for someone else, but are you aware of anyone that's expressed interest to, to date? Yeah, my understanding, I, I, I would defer to Enbridge, but my understanding oh. is there's been no formal inquiries oh. from any third party utilities yet. Okay, um, so taking that one step further, is there consideration, I, and I don't know, I don't know tunnel construction well uh, at all, but I, I have ideas. Are there, is there construction considered then for like brackets and uh, you know whatever it would be to hold those other utilities or will it be another construction process once a utility wants to come in after the fact potentially? Well, yeah, ideally you would think of this, the natural, um, requirements, for example, broadband, for example, high voltage electrical, you'd think of the requirements that you would need, the design requirements you'd need early on, and then add those into the scope of design services without you know, going too far that would really change the design scope of a project. And so that process is, that's what this joint, this joint group will, will do. Yeah. Okay, I, I would think as an authority, we would want to have that yes. forward thinking being done for sure. I, definitely. Do you have other questions? I, I do. Uh, again, I'd just like to ask, since the authority really wasn't available during this period, is there anything that occurred that is compromising uh, success or the quality of the pipeline? Of the Be tunnel? No. Uh, the tunnel, I'm sorry, because, because of our not being able to uh, review what was going on? No, not at all. So I did a very detailed review of the preliminary specifications that were in the RFPs, and it's, it's very state-of-the-art tunnel practice. Yeah. Uh, uh, and now as we really set in motion the, the development of the final specifications, which mm -hmm. occurs throughout 2020, um, there's, no, there's yeah. been no adverse impact, in when, my opinion. Thank you. When you talk about uh, specifications, do those include safety and access and access over a period of time and uh, this 99 year requirement that we have a, a, a stable pipeline for our tunnel for that period? Yes, how absolutely. About, how about the environmental issues? Is that in that also? Yeah, so I'll, I'll address one of those, I'll, I'll address those one by one. So okay. this, the service life of the tunnel, the 99 year service yeah. life is absolutely uh, part and parcel of the development of the specifications. Um, uh, safety um, and, and sort of life cycle assessment, fire life safety is all considered and accounted for in the development of the specifications. So it gets into the details of exactly Good. how will the tunnel be uh, accessible, how yeah. will it be operated, yeah. um, and so that's all included in it. The environmental considerations are first in the permit applications, which will be on the agenda a, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, absolutely, impact to the environment is 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 central, just like safety is, is sort of, it's the breathing. We, we all 
factor in those aspects um, throughout any any tunnel design project in the conceptual design of the tunnel is it assumed uh, that we will always have access inside that tunnel for 99 years? Do you mean like on a daily basis? Mm, uh, or I mean, there was one, I, I heard someplace that there was, a pot, there was one thought that, well, maybe they would fill the tunnel as a way to stabilize it rather, rather than have it so that we could go in and, and examine what's going on or, or continuously think about adding utilities to the tunnel. Right, right, yeah, good point. So during the, just to, for background for others, during the feasibility study, it was contemplated should you backfill the tunnel mm -hmm. with, uh, after the pipeline is placed, yes. backfill it with the grout material or backfill it with water yeah. or leave it completely open and accessible. Yes. And so in, in, the, in the process, those things will be defined and, and specified. That okay. will be in the technical specifications. Okay. And the authority has the approval authority on those specifications. So okay. the decision to leave it open or to backfill it will ultimately come to you as the authority members. Okay, thank you. Now, within the identity, you know, this, the team itself, I think we should um, have you know, like name the safety and the environmental person, because like every, you know, it, when I look at this and it, as a as a member of this team. The number one priority for me is everybody goes in and out of this safely. And whenever I start any meetings, the first thing we're ever going to do is talk about safety. And so if we have a point person, we should name them and we should all know who the environmental and the safety and environmental people are. Point them out within this, I don't know if it's this section or wherever, but so if any one of us want to call and ask about it, we know who to speak with because it should be, you know, every morning that's the first thing they should talk about. So. I'm sure I'm sure Enbridge is in tune with that, but as members of this group, we want to be able to speak to someone and say, "Is this going the way we thought it was?" Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did, did, did yeah. I, it, am you, I clear? You are very clear. Yeah, and I and I can assure you, both from the authority side and in the in the meetings that we've had jointly, safety is is the top priority. It's always discussed the first thing. And from the authority and the state perspective, we obviously have to be great stewards of the environment and safety, um, not just during construction, but during the 99 year life of this thing, there needs to be a very safe environment. Um, thank, you. thank you. Mike, uh, just to kind of bring this full circle. So jointly developed, I, I think that we've kind of bounced around safety, environmental, specifications continue to be developed until this thing is built correct I mean we're we're still in the process that's why you're uh, you mentioned bringing on some folks from MDOT which I'm very encouraged by uh, you're bringing on professionals and that team continues to grow and the specifications and the design and everything continues to evolve until we actually build this thing correct yeah that's correct you want to get uh, at 100% at design you are essentially you've completed the development of your 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 project specifications. So they aren't finalized by any means right now. They're, not they're not at this point. This input here is going to be considered. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Yeah. Any other questions? This is probably just a question for later. Uh, how? The, I mean, there are two issues. One is what are the specifications? Do they satisfy uh, the objective of this tunnel? And then the second one is the tunnel. What is the as-built situation of the tunnel? Who, who does the as-built? I'm just curious. Yeah, so there'll be a, a quality issue. I think maybe what you're referring to yeah. is who assures the quality of the constructed exactly. tunnel. Exactly. Yeah, so there is, I'll address it now. Yeah. It, I think it's on the agenda, but there is a, uh, a requirement in the agreement that Enbridge will provide the funding to support an independent yeah. um, quality assurance yes. contractor that works on behalf of the authority. Yes. And so that role of that, uh, QA, that QA yeah. role is to ensure or assure yeah. that the tunnel is constructed as per the jointly developed project specifications that that are laid out throughout this year. Yes. And so that at the completion of, of tunnel construction, when there is the ownership transfer from Enbridge to the authority and then the lease agreement from authority to Enbridge, 
that the project specifications that are jointly developed and approved by you as the authority were in fact um, uh, were met yes. during construction. When does that QA person uh, or contract be let? I'm just curious. Sure. Uh, so I'm saying these things often for the audience as well as myself. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Rough, rough schedule is that QA contract. So tunnel construction should begin sometime in in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there'll be some timeline discussion a little bit later on per Enbridge. Mm -hmm. And so you'd want to have the QA person uh, or entity in place before that. Okay. So sometime beginning in early 2021, roughly. Thank you. Commissioner, the, the uh, agenda does have uh, an actionable item on the quality assurance um, consultant uh, that we'll discuss here in just a little bit. So good questions, though. Uh, any other questions on this uh, uh, joint specifications team? With that, uh, I would accept a, um, a motion to accept the recommendation from our consultant. So moved. And second. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, Mike. Okay, so deliverable number three is the draft procurement and contracting execution plan. This is required per tunnel agreement section 7.5A. This draft procurement and contracting execution plan includes the contract execution models to complete the design and construction of the tunnel or design construct of the tunnel. It includes Enbridge procurement and quality processes that includes a general description of the RFP and bid solicitation process. It includes contractor qualification process and contractor proposal evaluation and selection criteria. And it includes a timeline for the execution of each RFP package. Um, so, Enbridge provided that document, and in that document, it details their, their method, which includes the selection of a project or procurement project delivery model that includes a design engineer, contract, and a construction manager, general contractor, pre-construction services contract. In this delivery model, the tunnel construction contract will follow through subsequent agreement with the CMGC. CMGC is just an acronym for Construction Manager General Contractor. Enbridge also separately contracted, as I mentioned earlier, with an owner's engineer. So they selected the design engineer and CMGC model to bring early constructor involvement in the project, to accelerate the schedule of the project and to allow for design optimization through involvement of constructability, among other reasons. Um, Enbridge also summarized in this document, this deliverable, their procurement process, including the qualifications, the selection process, and evaluation criteria. Their qualification selection process involves a two-phase approach one is the submission and evaluation of written proposals from the design engineer and the CMGC, and followed by in-person interviews of shortlisted participants. Their plan summarized the RFP draft evaluation criteria within the categories of project approach, key project personnel, project management plan, approach to collaborating and coordinating, and risk and safety. Enbridge provided a procurement and quality process timeline for RFP issuance of the owner's engineer, design engineer, and CMGC to be completed throughout uh, by December of 2019. So the design engineer and the CMGC procurement approach is a well, this is my opinion to you, is, is a well accepted project delivery model. Uh, this model enables very early constructor involvement that is really important for this Straits Tunnel project. The model also does allow for time saving over other procurement methods and enables risk reduction through this continuous constructability review throughout the design uh, process. I also find that the qualification selection process 
and evaluation criteria summarized in the plan to be in line with standard practice for tunnel projects. The timeline is reasonable and overall I find the draft procurement and contracting execution plan to be satisfactory. Can I answer any questions about the, the procurement plan? Where, where do we address the Michigan, you know, using Michigan workforce? Is that within the RFP? That's coming up next. Okay. Actually, two items in the future. I'll, I'll go that, through that, that in great detail. So that's on the RFP. Okay. It probably isn't the issue of the issue for the board, but I'm just curious. On the construct CMGC way of contracting, there are often penalties, and then there's also contingencies. I'm sure you've looked. Have they assigned what those are going to be? You mean for the construction for the contract? Construction, yeah. So the construction contract will come later. Okay. Right now, uh, the the two RFPs that are described just in for the, the the groups then. Yeah, this yeah. is just for what's called design services, yes. and then uh, pre-construction services. And the goal there is to get the constructor contractor involved yeah. early. Yes. No. Uh, we do the same thing in buildings and yeah the university. So I agree with you. It's best way to operate yeah Mike uh, this is off the wall question uh, just a rough estimate how many projects have you been involved in worldwide over the years oh uh, many sorry does, to throw your curveball yeah sorry <laughs> uh, hard to know I don't know some on the order of probably 20 this process in looking at it you feel very good about it, it I mean from from your experience of dealing with those other projects, it allows us to keep moving forward in a, in a very efficient manner. We don't, we don't want to go overly fast, but we want to get this done. We want to get tho those pipelines off the bottom of the straits. So being efficient is important here. But uh, you feel this is uh, the, the best possible uh, process that we could be using to move this forward. Yeah, there's, there's many different procurement approaches that are used successfully to build tunnels. What's, and I like this one. It, what's really good about it for, uh, for all parties involved is it's getting very early from day one the constructor involved. Tunnel projects are not just sort of like a vertical building above ground where you can just design it and turn it over uh, to a contractor and say build per spec. There's really a lot of these constructability aspects that you want in the design so that you can make a robust design um, and, and reduce the potential risks along a project. So I do like this, this approach. So the, there, there's a potential that the contractor that w is involved in the CMGC ends up building this, therefore a lot of their input has already been given. That's correct, and, and the design of the procurement approach is that the CMGC pre-construction constructor is the one that builds the tunnel. Okay, thank you. Is that it? On That's this it, yeah, on All this right. one. Uh, then uh, again, I would look for a motion to accept the recommendation from our consultant. A motion to approve. Second. All those in favor, signify by aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Mike? All right, so two more deliverables for me to report on. I'm going to now talk about the geotechnical data report. So this is required per tunnel agreement 7.2. This was submitted by Enbridge on December 23rd, 2019. The geotechnical data report provides the factual record of all geotechnical data collected during the site investigation campaign of 2019 and prior. So this is the 2,600 uh, glorious pages of information about the geological setting of the straits. It provides a summary of the historical data and previous investigations that have been conducted in the area, for example, for the bridge. It describes the geotechnical investigation program carried out and details the field investigation borings. Um, it includes the boring logs, which is a, a record of, of the drilling and the sampling that was conducted from onshore borings, nearshore borings, and then in the deep water. The geotechnical data report also includes in situ test results conducted within the boreholes, results from hydrogeological testing within the boreholes, and then laboratory test results from boring samples. So I find the geotechnical data report to be satisfactory in accordance with state of practice in tunnel engineering. Can I answer any questions about the geotechnical data report? 
all of that data, our cores, and then are they turned over to the state for future use? I think maybe we can ask Enbridge to address that a little okay. bit later, but my understanding is there's a willingness to, to, uh, to share that. To share that. Okay. But that's, I'll leave that for Enbridge to address. Sure. And your core densities, the amount of cores you drilled per square foot, let's say, were determined by standard method? Or did you, you know, if you found an anomaly, did you drill more? Or, I mean, how did you go about that? Sorry, what's the question? The amount of cores per, you know, your core densities, okay, is that based on standard practices? Did you have to dig more for things you found, or was it routine? Or, you know, you, when you started, oh, yeah, I'm sure you made a grid and you had so many cores going down the line, and did you find anything that had you, you know, dig more cores and have to look at it, or was it fairly routine? I guess is my question. Yeah, so maybe you want to leave that question for later for when Enbridge comes up, or you want me to address generally? Oh, I, yeah, it's just a yeah general I, question. I mean, yeah, I will say just generally from a tunneling perspective, um, um, the, the the approach that was used is very typical, where you lay out a number of boring logs along your alignment. Um, and then you're trying to optimize where you place those alignments to characterize the most uncertain areas. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you encounter, you try to have a flexible drilling program so that you can adjust as you go. If you drill in a certain area and you discover, oh, this is a bit different than we, we thought it might be, then you may change your, your position for the next boring, boring log uh, to, to account for that uncertainty. Does that answer your question? I'll, I'll grill them when they come up. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? If I... uh, with that, can uh, I get a motion to accept Mike's recommendation? So moved. And second. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, Mike, one more to go. Okay, last one for me. And um, this is on the uh, draft request for proposals. So this is the last deliverable that I'll discuss uh, per the agreement. This is the draft request for proposals to solicit proposals to design or design construct the tunnel. So this is required per tunnel agreement section 7.5B and submitted to Enbridge on August 19, 2019. Uh, this was actually not due until April 30 of this year, but because of the procurement approach, um, it, it allowed moving forward with, with, this, with these RFPs. Per the agreement, the RFPs are to address seven things. One, qualifications of proposed contractors. And I'm going to talk through these individually. Qualifications of proposed contractors, including a requirement that the contractor and any proposed subcontractors are not in violation of environmental and safety laws, regulations, rules, and permits. Number two, uh, a request for jointly developed project specifications. Number three, statement that both the MS, both the authority and the state of Michigan are not subject to any financial risks or liability. Number four, a commercial structure. Number five, key progress reports and deliverables required throughout the duration of the work. Number six, a change management procedures section. And number seven, a requirement that proposed contractors provide a plan for how they intend to engage Michigan's labor pool. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk through all seven of these and then give you my, my feedback on them. First of all, the qualifications section. So there's two RFPs that were provided, one for design engineering services, one for CMGC pre-construction services. Both of these RFPs require multiple sections for qualifications in, by proposers. The technical submission portion of the proposal response requires documentation of key personnel with tunnel experience, a list of re relevant major tunnel projects and their details, relevant experience on similar tunnel boring machine projects with similar ground conditions, similar water pressures, relevant experience with pipelines and with similar procurement approaches. Both RFPs require proposals to document their company's health and safety records and their corporate social responsibility records. Both RFPs 
require the design engineer and CMGC proposers to indicate if they have any regulator, including the state of Michigan or court imposed fines, penalties, disciplinary actions, or measures on the proposer. Um, both RFPs require the indication of whether there is any ongoing or outstanding litigation or other proceeding re related to conflict of interest resulting from any action or lack thereof by the proposer in the past five years. Any findings of noncompliance by a regulator, internal or external auditor, a court or ongoing litigation in any jurisdiction, and at any level against the proposer in the past five years. So from this perspective, the RFP fully complies with the requirement in the regarding qualifications. The second one regarding project specifications. So as we discussed earlier, these are the technical requirements. So the both RFPs include an extensive list in Exhibit B of both RFPs, uh, a detailed list of preliminary project specifications. All the listed specifications in the RFPs are in accordance with the tunnel agreement and with state of practice in tunnel engineering. So I consider this ex existing list of project specifications to be preliminary because final specifications are by definition developed during detailed design. Hey Mike, um, let's uh, just, just to offer the opportunity for one second on each one a question. Okay, sure. That yeah. way we don't have to circle back and it's all jumbled because there's seven of them. Are there any questions on the first two? Either uh, one of you? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that sure. we okay. weren't bouncing yeah. back and forth. All right. So that's qualifications. That's project specifications, both of which I believe are satisfactory per the, as listed in the RFPs. The third one is financial risk and liability statement. So both RFP data sheets state, and I quote, the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority and the state of Michigan are not subject to any financial risks or liabilities. That's verbatim right out of the agreement. So that's I, satisfied. I think, that one's, I think that one's great because that's what the law says. Uh, we cannot take on any financial risk at all. And so uh, it's great to see that one laid out clearly. Uh, Criteria four, commercial structure. So the both RFPs have extensive commercial structure sections within a 96-page engineering services agreement and a 61-page pre-construction services agreement. So they're laid out pretty standard language on commercial structure. And so that's satisfactorily met. Number five, key progress reports and deliverables. The RFPs include specific language requesting progress reports by both the design engineer and CMGC. In addition, key deliverables are listed for the design engineer in Exhibit A and for the CMGC in their Exhibit A. So these, these sorts of uh, key deliverables would, be in, it would include things like the draft geotechnical baseline report, uh, a 30% design plans, a 60% design report, 30% construction estimates. So they're, they're laid out in both RFPs what these key deliverables would be. Mike, um, so on that one, would, would those be items that you would then review and we would get reports or were, will this information come to us in, in some other form? Yes, so we, we would, I, in my role as the uh, a subject matter expert consultant to the authority, I would review each of these deliverables. Okay, and then report back to us. And then or, report, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we would get reports on yeah. that. Is the idea that we would have a public meeting at each of those steps, or is it just accumulate them? I, I would envision accumulating them and, and do them. That maybe we will end up having quarterly meetings throughout this process. Okay. Uh, so criteria six of seven, then, in the RFPs, is to include change management procedures. And so both RFPs include change management procedure articles. Um, and I can get specific with where they are, but they're in the RFP. So that, that's satisfactory per the agreement. And then the last one is Michigan labor. Good. Just so the technical, on, oh yeah. Question on that one. What kinds of things would cause this change? The change of uh, man, you, you, change management occurs because you found some problem or you found a better way to do something, what, what, what's causing the change? 
Well, it, I think in any, any engineering yeah. problem, as you move through detailed design, um, okay, just, so this is still in the design phase, not, yeah, this during, is, not during construction. Yeah, this is not for during construction. Oh, okay. I, right. Sorry, thank you. But that change management um, approach or procedures would also then be a significant yeah, and important component of, of construction. the construction contract. Yeah. Absolutely. And so this would be surprises in the geotechnical data or what? What? Yeah, th these are things like differing site conditions I where see. a constructor encounters ground that perhaps wasn't, and this happens quite often in sure. tunnel projects, and so you want to have change management procedures in place uh, for that. Absolutely. And okay. I will say that in the agreement, the, the state is not at all liable for any of those aspects. The authority is not liable. No. And thank you. Yes. So within Michigan Labor, the technical requirements section of both RFPs requires the proposers to address how they will incorporate Michigan Labor. Specifically, proposers are required to detail their plan to engage Michigan's labor pool, including means and methods for recruitment, training, and utilization. Any questions on, on that? You had a question about labor before. Yeah. All set? Yeah. I, yeah. I just, well, okay, do you, is this the idea you specify what fraction of the effort is Michigan labor? I, I, I'm not familiar with these labor kinds of agreements, but is how, what, what is, I, I, is it, it's got to be more than just saying that we're going to include Michigan labor. What, how does it work? Maybe I could leave that question for Enbridge to okay. address sure. in terms of how they're that would be moving fine. forward with that. It's okay. I just I'd like to know sometime. Yeah, sure. That'd be fine. Sure. I do see folks from the laborers and the operating engineers here uh, in support today, and so it's good to see them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure they're interested in this section of the agreement. Yeah. All right. With that, any other questions? No. The only thing it doesn't cost us money, but it costs us time. So that's the only thing I ever you know. If we have changes in that, but you can't write all of that in, obviously. But no, you did a nice job, and thank you so much. Yeah, so I'd just wrapping up on this on this deliverable regarding the draft RFPs. I find both RFPs to be satisfactory, to be in accordance with standard practice of tunnel engineering, and in compliance with the tunnel agreement. I guess this one then we would probably want to be a little more detailed and and concur that the RFPs comply with the seven requirements that that Mike laid out for us and that are stated in the tunnel agreement. Uh, can I get a motion to that effect? Uh, so move. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll still be here in case other questions come up. Of course. Yes. Uh, next up, I'd like to uh, invite Ryan Mitchell uh, with MDOT to come forward and just give a brief explanation of the escrow plan that has been presented by Enbridge. Good morning, Chairman, members of the authority. Um, so uh, section 8.3 of the tunnel agreement requires that uh, Enbridge accept, uh, provide within 270 days after the agreement's executed um, a procedure to establish and manage escrow accounts um, to, um, to which um, Disper disbursements will be made in the event um, that a delay, um, it, the, uh, the events contemplated, I'm sorry, uh, Section 8, to back up one moment, uh, describes incentives in the contract, in the, in the agreement rather, um, related to performance of the obligations of Enbridge, and there are, there are delay um, um, compensation penalties for delay by Enbridge. Um, so this requirement of the agreement is simply to establish a procedure, to, to submit a procedure for establishing these uh, escrow accounts. Um, there's three requirements for the procedure. It's that um, in Section 8.3 that, the, that it, the, the escrow agent be an independent financial institution that the terms of the escrow agreement are established um, through a written agreement and that 
Enbridge be responsible for all the costs and administrative fees um, related to, to um, the escrow agreement. They've submitted that the, this was due by the terms of the tunnel agreement on September 16th of 2019. It was received by Enbridge um, August 30 of 2019 and it is in compliance with the tunnel agreement. So are there any questions on the escrow account? It sounds as though, based on Mike's report, that Enbridge has met every uh, timeline requirement that has been set forth to date in the tunnel agreement. All those that have elapsed, correct, yes. okay. including this, including which is also a requirement. There are sure. others, but they haven't reached term yet. Sure. Uh, so with uh, Ryan's uh, review, I believe that we can approve the escrow plan that has been submitted uh, in case it is needed to be used in the future. If Enbridge misses any of their timeline requirements in the future, the tunnel agreement lays out escrow accounts that would be sent to, set up. And the plan includes, Ryan, uh, a third party financial institution where that escrow would be set up? Correct. Okay. So with that, I would ask uh, that we approve the escrow plan. So move. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. Uh, with that, it sounds like Enbridge has been very diligent in complying with the terms of the tunnel agreement. Um, and uh, so with that, I'd like to invite representatives from Enbridge to come up to the podium uh, to give us an update. I'll start that again, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the authority. Um, thank you for inviting Enbridge to be here today. Uh, my name is Peter Holwin. I am Director of Government Relations for Enbridge um, and have uh, been working uh, with, the authority, with the authority, but before that with the agreements uh, throughout this process. Uh, just make some opening comments and I uh, appreciate the, the actions that were taken here today on behalf of the agreement, uh, Enbridge does, uh, is committed to building the Great Lakes uh, Tunnel Project. Um, we believe this is the best long-term solution uh, to securing the energy that is necessary for not only Michigan, but for the region, and while also uh, addressing a joint uh, value, a joint vision that we all have, which is protecting the Great Lakes. Uh, we know that uh, at this point the, the tunnel project um, will be, uh, I won't say revolutionary, but it will be monumental, is the word I was looking for, uh, in construction. Uh, it's something that, has, uh, you know, that hasn't been contemplated before, but is something, as we've heard from some of the tunneling experts around the world, is very feasible and very doable. And what is attractive for the situation that we are in is that it will take a safe pipeline and make it even safer and will reduce that risk to the Great Lakes to almost zero. Uh, Enbridge has been diligently working over the last several uh, months and it is a year or so as you have heard to comply not only with the agreement but to move this project forward on the timelines and on the schedule that uh, that have been laid out and it is an aggressive schedule. Uh, but it is one that uh, Enbridge has committed to, to the government of Michigan, to this, to this governor. And we do believe that we are on schedule and will be uh, able to, um, uh, pending the, the um, uh, obtainment of permits, uh, to start construction by the end of 2021. And then over a two-year tunneling process, we will be able to complete this project by the end of 2024, which has always been the goal. Um, so with that brief overview, what I would like to do is invite Amber Pastor, who is our project director, uh, to the podium to give a, a, an update of where we are. You heard a lot of the milestones that we've hit, but uh, she's going to give us a little more um, uh, detail about where we are in the process and where we are in, uh, going in the future. First, I would like to thank my colleague, Peter Holren, for promoting me to director. Uh, 
Thank you, Peter. I'm uh, actually the project manager on the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the authority, thank you so much. Again, my name is Amber Pasteur. I am the project manager on the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. I have been engaged in some way, shape, or form since Enbridge originally signed the agreement with the state of Michigan back on November 27th. 27th of 2017. I have been living and breathing the feasibility report and now the tunnel project since that time. I'd like to begin with a quick overview. Uh, it will, I will hit a couple of the points that Mike Mooney uh, touched on, um, but I think they bear, bear repeating quite frankly, and I did put together a, a slide. I think it helps us as we walk through, looking back to uh, a number of the tunnel agreement milestones that have now been completed. So those, uh, when you look at the timeline we've set up there, the completed agreement deliverables are noted on the top. Those are the items Mike Mooney just walked through and the key project milestones that we've been able to complete are noted on the bottom as well as a look to the future, what we expect in 2020 through into 2021. So we've completed all of the geotechnical investigation programs onshore and nearshore done in July of this past year. The deep water geotechnical investigation program completed in November of last year. We generated the geotechnical data report. I like Mike Mooney's reference to it as a glorious 2,600 page document. It is glorious, uh, full of information, um, outstanding detail uh, captured in that report. Uh, we did um, not only submit the preliminary engineering activities work plan, but I can um, inform you and update you that we've practically completed all of those preliminary engineering activities that we described in that report and committed to completing. And finally, we executed uh, the procurement and contracting execution strategy that we described and that we submitted. That has been done. And I would like to just take a moment and provide you with an update on that contracting strategy. At the beginning of this year, Enbridge selected a design contractor and a pre-construction contractor for the tunnel. We did that so we could move forward in earnest with advancing the project, demonstrating our commitment to both safety and experience and to the state of Michigan in this authority. We have selected two industry leading contractors for the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. I will tell you that when we issued the RFP, you can note there back in August of 2019, we had outstanding response from the tunneling community, from the tunneling industry. Uh, we cast a wide net to make sure we did get the best, the best experts, the best construction contractor, the best design engineer we could. We did cast that wide net, but quite frankly, we didn't have to go very far. I'm really excited to announce here today that Enbridge has selected a Michigan-based tunneling contractor, the Great Lake Tunnel Contractors, to build the project and to provide that pre-construction services. The Michigan-based firm, tunnel contracting firm, is a partnership between a company called JD. Their home office is in Livonia, Michigan. They partnered with a US affiliate of a Japanese company called Obayashi. And this is an amazing team. And I'm excited to be able to work with them. In addition to that, and I don't want to I, I lose sight of the design engineer as well, we hired a, 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 a um, a world-renowned design company called Arup, A-R-U-P, and they will be joining our team as the design engineer. I'd also like to move on a little bit as we look to the future, uh, as, uh, going back to our timeline now there. The year of 2020 is really about two critical activities. The first critical activity is we need to file for our government approvals and our permit applications. And the second thing we need to do is carry on with the detailed design of the project. So as we look forward on that, we are working right now on developing two critical path applications. Referred to up there, you can see the green milestone marker as the JPA, that stands for Joint Project Application. That is a filing that will go to the Army Corps of Engineers and EGLE, which is the Michigan Environmental Permitting Agency. And we also plan before the end of April filing as well that with the Michigan Public Service Commission. So those applications, we are developing those right now. We're happy to have our constructor and our design engineers onboarded as we prepare those filings. Uh, 
This work also included um, uh, throughout the summer of 2019, we did a number of environmental surveys and studies. Those are important aspects of those environmental filings. And as well, we met and had pre-consultation filing meetings with the core and with EGLE. Those meetings are critical. They provide us with really valuable guidance on their expectations. What are they looking for from their perspectives when it comes to the environmental impacts or the potential environmental impacts of constructing the tunnel? With guidance from those agencies, we are on track with making those filings by the end of April, bo uh, both of those, or to both the Eagle, to the Corps, and to the Public uh, Service Commission. And then as we look to the future, um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, we hope to receive those permits. I'm having troubles reading the, own graph, the graph that I wrote myself from back here. We hope to receive those permits. We've allowed an 18-month permitting window. So if we're successful at, at receiving those project approvals within that 18-month window, we would look at beginning constr construction in Q3 of 2021. We anticipate an in-service state, we're targeting an in-service state at the end of 2024. It will take two years to mine across the Straits of Mackinac. That's by far the biggest activity when we think about what that schedule looks like. I will also point out to you at the top there, and as Ryan alluded to earlier, there are some outstanding remaining agreement deliverables. One of those is that we um, complete all of the activities that we described in the preliminary activities report by the end of April of this year. And then we had commitments around the timing of filing for government approvals. I've highlighted the critical path ones. There are other ones. Those have to be done within 180 days of completing the geotechnical baseline report. We are also required to commence construction within 180 days of receiving all of our approvals. And we have two outstanding items, the, com uh, the tunnel completion report and the tunnel operations and maintenance plan. And once we're closer to getting that tunnel complete, those are when those plans are going to be submitted and provided to the authority as per the agreement. So that is kind of a recap of where we've come from, a look forward into the future. And with that, I can take any questions. Yes. Uh, one of the things in the agreement it was saying that the, that the Authority and, and Enbridge would go together on the permitting. I, I've always wondered why that was to be so, and does that necess is that a good idea? It seemed like the, the, the authority it should be more of a review than an active participant in permitting. So, yeah. Tony, let me, uh, let me um, touch on that as well, okay. uh, because I think it's a question really not necessarily for Amber, but maybe for... Our legal counsel, uh, we have Ray Howd here yeah. uh, with the Attorney General's office, and and he and I have had yeah. some conversations about that same question. So Good. let's let uh, Ray address it for all of us. That that would be fine. I I did want to hear if if Enbridge saw any advantage to that, but that's fine. Yes, uh, the intent of the statute really is that the authority should not be financially obligated uh, in in any. Respect, yeah. and while the agreement does provide for uh, joint application, uh, the permit process, uh, it's not mandatory, and in fact um, allows uh, Enbridge to um, uh, apply for their permits individually yeah. after 90 days. Yeah. Uh, if uh, if the authority doesn't yeah. um, actually uh, join on to the uh, permit application, would there be advantage to us relaxing that 90 days so that? They didn't have to wait. I, I guess I would I would believe that if we waive the option to even be a co-applicant on any of these permits, um, it waives the 90 days. It allows them to move, to move forward, forward. And keep the efficient process. I agree. Uh, moving forward with the potential liability that we have in this, I mean, th there are th there's a situation of potential fines and penalties if uh, there is a. A violation there's yeah. mitigation costs yeah. we don't want any of that no. financial burden coming with us and so oh. I believe that we should uh, have a motion to waive uh, the joint applicant process okay. allow uh, Enbridge to move forward um, Mike will end up uh, receiving these permits and have an opportunity to take a look at them once they are submitted so uh, we're going to be in the ball game yeah. just not 
part of the permit directly. Is it appropriate to make the motion now? Yes. I make such a motion. Do we have a support? I'm thinking. Yes, I'll support it. Okay. Uh, the, the, with that, uh, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. I had another question. Yes. It, I had asked Mike earlier whether the data, the geotechnical data and the cores would be uh, available to the state just for future uh, uh, reference and anything else they may be trying to do. Absolutely. That is 100% something we want to have a conversation with about, okay. uh, with an appreciation. We also uh, want to be respectful and have good dialogue with the tribes as well. Who, sure. So I think between uh, working with, 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 with the authority and with the state, uh, when the time is appropriate, I think we can discuss what exactly will happen with those cores, and I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, okay. for everybody. Yes. Uh, all right. So it's still yeah. just an open issue. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. Are you going to ask me the question about geotechnical and the bores? I was going to, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm already stuck on a statistically homogeneous by two doctors. So I'm a little, no, I, was, I would, yeah, I get, you yeah. know, my thought is, you know, here you are digging. And the yeah. question would be, you know, did you come across things that would cause you to dig more We're, holes than normal? And mostly I wanted to answer because we went through actually quite a thoughtful process on the placement of those geotechnical boreholes. There was two things that we had to think about. We had to think about where are the best places to put them. So from a technical perspective, we could yield the best possible information about the tunnel alignment. The other thing that we had to think about was the permitting process. We had to re receive permits from the Army Corps of Engineers and from Eagle. So it, it, that all had to be play into it. So um, why I like talking about this, quite frankly, is because we um, had some expert advice. We had um, design engineers and other subject matter experts who helped us originally develop a plan. Then in December of 2019, Ambridge, we hosted what we called market sounding meetings. And in that, during that period, we actually invited seven construction contractors to sit with us, and we just picked their brain, essentially. And we showed them our plan, and we said, what do you guys think? Here's what we're thinking. And we got feedback from all seven of those construction contractors that we then went and reflected in the ultimate design and the spacing of our borehole program. So what we did, because we had to respect the permitting process, is we identified a certain number of boreholes as per the terms of our permit, and then we had a certain number that we were allowed to place as we were uh, determining and on in real time discovering information about the straits, seeing what the results were. So we had some flexibility to infill some of those boreholes where it made sense to do so. So I would suggest to you that we had a really robust a geotechnical investigation program and it is really helping us as we move forward into design. You're the most enthusiastic hole driller I've Thank ever you. met. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to encourage you guys to talk about permits. I've done a lot of yeah. permitting in my life. Yeah. Yeah. And we, our intent is for the tribes, the environmental world, the public, the state, the EPA, and everyone to vet. It's an open process. We're here to listen. Yeah. You know, and you've gone through this a lot, I'm sure Edbridge has, but the whole thing is uh, very transparent. And we, that's why we're here today. We're here to listen. We're here to, you know, we all have open ears and bridges, we do. And, you know, the thing, the whole idea is to vet this. And get through the because it, it's in the best interest of the state to try to get through the permitting process. Because if anything's going to slow us down, it could be the permits. And we want the permits to get through, and we want everyone to be satisfied with where we're going. And the best way to do that is come to these, give us your opinions, and we'll go through this and try and we'll do it in a in a, in a matter that's been vetted publicly. And we look forward to the opportunity. Actually, Thank you guys have been through it many many times, and I'm sure that's what you're looking for. I, I just have one, I suppose, technical question. Maybe I should have asked Mike, but uh, when, you, when you do the geotechnical work, your primary interest is uh, does, it, does the geology affect what you want to do with the tunnel? Yes. Do you also look at whether it interrupts, uh, makes new conduits between uh, porous layers that might change the groundwater situation? And, under the channel? If I understand the question, it, you mean in relation to the, the placement of those boreholes and then the ultimate uh, bore, um, uh, mining of the tunnel itself? Or? Uh, the question is, will the tunnel change anything about the groundwater s circulation in, 
under the lakes? You know, that is actually an excellent question for Mike, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I know about that, and the answer to that is no, that's very unlikely, but okay. Mike, that may be a better question for you to respond to. Okay. But just having a hole there that could flow around won't, won't cause anything like that. No, because it's designed to be completely sealed off. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, you guys did a hydro geo study also? Was that part of it? It was a hydrogeological. Which would tell you that you're not going to interrupt that. That's what that was for, correct? Well, that, that gives you Yes, I'll backtrack and answer the first question. Yes. So there is no impact of a, of a tunnel on the groundwater regime. Okay. By design, the tunnel is gasketed to be water um, impenetrable. Yeah. So it does not impact the groundwater table. And then with regard to the hydrogeological testing that's typically done during the site investigation is to better understand the process of tunneling through the material, to look at um, the process by which a tunnel boring machine will maintain the equilibrium with the groundwater conditions as it moves through and builds that tunnel. So that was part of the original, part of the spec to do with the uh, borings was to look at the hydrogeo and the Yes, effects. yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mike, we'd like your presentations fr from now into the future to be a little more positive, enthusiastic like Amber's are. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions of Amber? Well done. Amber, I, I do have a, a couple. So can you explain the, the uh, process in the construction industry? I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that JD yeah. out of Livonia, a Michigan-based contractor, was chosen. I'm familiar with them. Great choice, great yeah. company. I uh, look forward to hearing from them in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm very fired up to hear that. So explain to us, in the construction industry, we have a competitive bid process, and uh, we'd like to hear about that a little bit here I am bit here so today. glad that you asked me that, because in my bit of my nervousness of being up here, one of the really key things I wanted to articulate, I didn't, and your question hits it. When we were thinking about this process and thinking about the contracting strategy, one of the things that was so important to myself and to my director and our entire project team was making sure we had the right people. Project teams are successful because you get the right people. So as we were looking to select the construction contractor and the design engineers, one of the biggest aspects we looked at was who's your team? What do these people feel like? So we designed this process that went on, you know, we issued the RFP on August the 26th, but quite frankly, the process began much earlier in that. One of the very first things we did was reach out to the underground industry. Well, first of all, we had market sounding meetings. So through 2018, in December, we met with seven different construction firms. We met with six different design engineering firms in uh, February of 2019 those were just purely information gathering sessions we just open our minds up to them we let them come in but what it allowed us to do was get a feel for the companies and the people so already we started meeting these people. Then in July of uh, 2019, we invited all of the folks that said that they were interested in this project, and believe me, there was many. This project in the underground industry is well known. Everybody wanted to be part of it, quite frankly. Uh, we were the bell of the ball, if I can say that. Uh, so we invited all of them that were interested, and it was, this was really important to me. I've worked on a lot of major projects, and one of the things that people often lose sight of is they don't have a sense of place. So it was critical to me that we invited these folks that were interested in this project to come to the Straits of Mackinac. We toured them around. In fact, if you go to Google Earth right now and you look at the north side of the Straits near our existing facility, you will see a bus of load of people and you will see a broken down bus. <laughs> That's a whole other story. But you will see a bus and a bus load of people. That was the tour that we did. Those were people from all over North America and quite frankly the world who wanted to be part of this project. So it was important for me that they saw the place. They saw both sides of the Straits. It was important for me that they saw the Mackinac Bridge. They saw that the bridge was down to one lane because it was being painted because that's a reality. Tunnel building is all about logistics. So we had that face to face with them. They got to meet the com some of the members of the community, be in the community, get a feel for what it was like. After issuing the RFP, we then went on and we had a number of several other opportunities where we had face to face meetings with all of those folks. We brought them in, gave them an 
opportunity to ask us questions. They got an opportunity to ask us questions. We got an opportunity to, s to meet them again. Understand, how are they thinking about this project? What's important to them? And then finally, in making the decision, um, the interview process was fairly intense. We did something that was slightly unusual within the industry in that we actually gave them a case study and then we sat and observed them as they worked together as a team. So we shortlisted the designers and the constructors. We did your typical kind of interview, Q&A, and then we put them in a room, gave them this case study and watched them respond. And what that showed us was how they worked together as a unit, as a group. What did they think about? What did they deem that was important? And with all of that piece of information, uh, we, nailed, uh, we nailed it, narrowed it down, and, and finally made that selection with AIRUP and then the Great Lakes Tunnel Constructors, and JD being a part of that. So it was a really intense process. I'm impressed. Thank you. <laughs> any, any? Absolutely. No, no, no other questions? No. All right, thank you. thank you. Appreciate it. And Mr. Chairman, if we, if we may, we wanted to take one more moment because uh, one of the concerns that's on a lot of people's minds is the pipes that are still in the lakes at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, they continue to be safe. They continue to be operated safely. Uh, we have with us today some of our operations uh, leadership um, from uh, Brad Shamal, our Vice President of uh, U.S. Operations, Mike Moeller, who is our Director of Great Lakes Operations, and uh, Bob Leto, who is our Regional Manager actually has the day-to-day uh, -day operational management for this area. But I, I thought that it would be important uh, for the public, but also for the authority to hear some of the measures we're taking to continue to improve on safety at the Straits of Mackinac while this construction process takes place. And Brad, if I can ask you to come up and uh, address some of those measures. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, uh, Chairman Nystrom, uh, members of the authority. It's great to be back uh, in the room that uh, we actually signed the agreements uh, some 14 months ago. Hard to believe that that time has gone past. Um, I really do want to take a few minutes to talk about safety, and I appreciate uh, Member Richardson's um, introduction to this a little bit earlier in the presentation. Safety really is our top priority, and for the members of my team that are here uh, that Peter mentioned, and for all Enbridge employees, um, safety is our day job. It's, uh, it's what we're, we're very focused on. And, um, you know, and safety comes in many, many shapes and forms. So from a project perspective, we're undertaking the projects that we're doing to make safe systems safer. And so not only do we have work going on at the Straits, uh, we have work going on up and down the right of way on Line 5. We're replacing the St. Clair River crossing further down in the state. Uh, we're looking at uh, some 400 water crossings across the state, evaluating with the state subject matter experts uh, what needs to be done there. Um, so we're very uh, focused on those activities. Uh, we're also uh, very focused on safety when it comes to project safety, and I think that's where we were the question we were getting at. Uh, all the activities that happen, um, whether it's on the roadways, uh, whether it's in the communities, um, whether it's our pipeline operating system, um, we are going to be focused on safety. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it is our day job. Um, if you have any concerns along the way, we want to hear about it, uh, and we have an, an open line. Um, I, I wanted to talk about uh, some activities we have going on at the Straits. As Peter mentioned, we're committed to moving forward with uh, the ultimate risk uh, management project and that is to remove the dual pipelines from the bottomlands of the Straits. And we'll put it into a tunnel, we'll design and, or, and uh, have a design in, underway, and that will take away that risk. Um, in the meantime, though, um, we're very focused on ensuring uh, the safe operation of the existing dual pipelines that are there. Um, I'll point uh, or direct you to the slide and some pictures that we have underway. Um, we have uh, established an action plan specifically to uh, address the risk of a, an anchor strike on our dual pipelines while we're building the, the um, tunnel to remove the, the dual pipelines. Um, uh, and just uh, very quickly, three core actions that we have underway. Uh, the first is a, a Vesper uh, Guardian Protect system. Uh, it's a, it's a a web-based system which allows us to track and monitor vessels that are coming through the straits. Um, it also provides an opportunity for us to communicate with vessels coming through the straits. 
Uh, we've uh, submitted an application to the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, that has been approved. Uh, we have an application in front of the FCC awaiting approval that will allow us to essentially send a message to each and every vessel coming through the straits and to uh, warn them of the uh, infrastructure that they, they have on the bottomlands in that area. I'll ask you, how many vessels a year go through there? Um, Mike, do we have a, a tally on... Okay, so 300 at the tail end of the year. Okay, thank um, you. To, to give you some perspective. Um, we, we're also um, taking uh, further action. So we've got uh, cameras uh, that are we've established uh, in place uh, to allow us to uh, view the vessels coming through. Uh, those are fixed cameras on the shore. Uh, there are two in place today. Uh, they're being uh, monitored uh, on a seven day a week, 24 hour basis from our Superior Wisconsin Security Operations Center. Uh, we've established a, a Straits Operations Center, uh, which we're staffing seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, that primary feed will come directly here and we'll watch uh, those vessels coming through. And what we're looking for uh, on the lower right there is to actually uh, make sure that there are no uh, chains in the water, any uh, uh, vessel that is dragging a, an anchor through, which uh, we, on April 1st of, of uh, 2018, um, that in fact did happen. And so we're watching uh, that on a seven by 24 hour basis. Uh, last October, um, we went one step further and we actually put vessels on the water, our own monitoring vessels. Um, the intention there was not to police, but it was to work with the Mariners Association, with the ships coming through to uh, set them up for success and to make sure that you know we're going out there, we're doing a spot check uh, and, and we have the ability to do that. We had vessels on the water starting in October. In November, we went to uh, nighttime operations as well. So that was a seven day a week, 24 hour a day operation. Um, we discontinued it in January just due to ice. Um, but uh, we'll be putting that system back in place uh, in early spring. Uh, I forgot to mention on the camera uh, solution, we'll, we're also uh, putting in six uh, new cameras uh, in spring, and these are high-tech cameras. And, and in the lower right, you see kind of a, a, a FLIR uh, infrared photo, uh, which allows you to take uh, images uh, in low light conditions, whether it be nighttime, fog, other conditions, and uh, the new system that we'll have in place will have three cameras on the north uh, side of the straits uh, on either side of the bridge and then three cameras on the south uh, side of the straits to be able to continue to monitor these vessels coming through. If we could uh, advance the slide uh, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, some of the other activities that we have going on in the monitoring perspective. Oh, Brad, sorry, Tony, I, I, I just had a question. Did the, the anchor that drug, do they not know it was down there? The, the, the vessel company? Yeah. Um, it's my understanding they did not. Ah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're assuming that if you see it down, that if you tell them about it, they'll bring it up. That, that, that's right. It's, yeah, yeah there, there's been, there's, there are laws in place which uh, make it illegal to anchor in those areas. Yeah, um, and so, um, and I don't think any vessel would want to um, put an anchor down in that area. Okay. We're, we're uh, taking action to help uh, with that. We, it, we also have the ability uh, to do a direct call to our control center and have the ability to shut down and isolate our systems on, on a very short uh, notice if we need to. And so we can take direct action on our pipeline system, uh, but we have the ability through marine band radio and now with the Vesper system, uh, if we get FCC approval, to uh, provide them with notice on that. Okay. Um, a couple of uh, other things that we're looking at here uh, in the top left, uh, it's a picture of we've done some uh, testing with drones uh, to go out and do a similar uh, approach to what we do with our monitoring vessels on the water. Um, you know, I think that this is a great drone footage. Uh, it has its limitations though. Um, it, you need to have line of sight to a drone and that, that gets challenging over a four mile basis. Uh, any any uh, adverse weather, if you have clouds, uh, fog, anything like that, drones uh, aren't, aren't uh, the long-term solution. Um, and then in the, in the lower picture on the left is a picture uh, which was taken from shore. Uh, again, our shore observations during the winter months. And you see, the, again, the ability to monitor the vessels uh, from a distance uh, with, with the right cameras. 
On the right, I want to show uh, some of our results. I said in October we uh, put vessels on the water and, uh, and started monitoring very, very closely. Uh, the top right uh, photo is actually um, one where it was an abnormal condition. Uh, it's not typical to see uh, uh, a cable in the water, a chain in the water, and so uh, we, we went out there, we identified that. Um, it did prove to be just that, a cable dragging in the water, but had there been an anchor or any device on that, we were able to contact the vessel. We made them aware of it, they, they pulled it in, and so that was one example. Another example is down in the lower right. Pretty hardcore trolling there. Eh? It's pretty hardcore <laughs> trolling, yeah, we may have, it may have been by design and we're not sure, but uh, they did. They did correct it. And then down on the right, we actually observed a vessel which was doing something that was atypical. Um, they, they were basically um, making many passes in the area around the pipelines, and that drew our attention immediately. Um, we were able to contact the vessel, uh, and again, make contact. The vessel did explain that they uh, had attempted to uh, 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 anchor outside of the area, in, in adverse weather, uh, they weren't able to do that. They were aware that they couldn't anchor in here, and so they were basically biding time and waiting out uh, uh, conditions. Oh. Um, but we were able to pick up on that monitor, it, make contact with them, and make sure that they were aware of it. So just a couple of examples. Um, we're going to continue that program. Uh, we'll continue that program right on through until the tunnel is in place. The, the dual pipelines are removed from uh, the straits, and we're operating safely in the new tunnel. So with that, if uh, I, that's it for my comments. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Brad, I have one, you, something you just said, and I just want to have you reiterate it. There have been questions as to whether the dual pipelines would be removed, which mm -hmm. you just said, or just decommissioned. So your yep. plan is, is once this tunnel is built, that you would remove those dual pipelines. We, we, we are open to that, but we are open to consultation on that. And that's with the state and with uh, the tribal members. Uh, we want to do the right thing. Um, and so if it's if removal is the solution, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, but we want to make sure that we do the proper consultation on what the outcome should be for those dual pipelines. Appreciate that it would be a conversation. I, I just heard you, and I didn't want to put you on the spot. But no, that's good. I, I appreciate the clarification. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Tony? You did mention that it sounded like you said that removing the pipeline was part of the part of the plan with yeah. the tunnel is is it part of the plan with the tunnel or is it separate yeah and and the word i should have used is decommission yeah. and removal is is, well, is is a step of that if if it is decided that the best solution is removal of the pipelines the dual well, pipelines what i'm trying to determine is do we have any responsibility for that uh, I, I think it's i think it's just a conversation that we okay. they would report to us what their plan is uh, they're yeah, going to yeah. work with the okay uh, tribal folks and and others involved yeah. and uh, um, I'm sure that we'll have a conversation about it at a future meeting. It, it was Thank certainly you. discussed as, as we discussed the tunnel agreement uh -huh. and uh, we made a commitment that we were open to uh, yeah. whatever that outcome, whatever the best solution was from an environmental perspective. Uh, we were going to work with the state, uh, Eagle, and to determine and also with the, the, the tribe uh, tribes to make sure that we get input and then uh, determination will be made and, and we'll move forward. Thank so you. Sounds great, Brad. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. That'll be a good problem at that point. Any, anything else? Peter. No, Mr. Chairman, I uh, appreciate the time that you have afforded us today and uh, we'll be here all throughout the entire meeting, so if there are other questions that come up, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thanks. Great report. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Dr. Mooney, could we have you just come back up for probably about a minute or so? Uh, um, to discuss uh, the process going forward for our quality assurance consultant. Sure. So the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the agreement uh, specifically requires that a uh, calls for an independent QA, quality assurance of the construction process, and that would be funded by Enbridge. And so... <clears throat> Again, the, the role of the QA is, and I want to tie that back to these project specifications. So throughout the course of 2020, during the detailed design process, the joint this project specifications, techno, technical requirements for the tunnel will be jointly developed by the authority and by Enbridge and their consultants. 
Once those are there, then there's a QA role independent of Enbridge on behalf of the authority that will oversee essentially the construction process uh, to make sure that those project specifications are actually met uh, during construction. Because as you march through then to the end of construction and the, the turnover of the, the tunnel to the authority, you want some uh, independent QA that, that the tunnel was constructed as per the project specifications. And so that's the role of the QA, the quality assurance uh, consultant in this, in this process. A uh, question, usually uh, when you do the, the as-built studies, you collect data or you may take cores in the cement. How are those preserved? Where do, is, is there some, some place they reside? In terms of cores of the concrete yeah. and those sorts all, of things? All of, all of the, 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 the techniques that are used to verify that it, that it was built as designed, uh, there must be a repository someplace. Well, I think all of those, so there's definitely very detailed records yeah. of the QA process. And I'd just back up to say okay. that QC, quality control, control. It would be done by the constructor. And okay. the QA role is to oversee to make sure that okay. those QC records are kept. So those, those records will be kept uh, in perpetuity and okay. provided to the authority. As far as individual cores, those decisions can be spelled out in the... Uh, yeah. in the uh, sort of the, the documents that would be developed closer to the, the QA contract. Um, it may be you want to keep those. It may be you don't want to keep those. <laughs> yeah, I, well, you know, 10 years later, if something goes wrong, it's awfully nice to be able to go back and see what wasn't done or maybe there was a clue there that we missed. Yeah, certainly you don't want to lose any vital information. So it's yeah. a question of are the records, you photo record all cores, that's pretty typical. Uh, you record the data collected from those. For example, you would do compression testing sure. of concrete cores. Um, yeah. So you definitely keep those records. Whether you need to keep the specific cores or not uh, can be determined sure. through the process. Okay. So this is a process, QCQA, quality quality control, quality assurance is a process that's used across the construction industry very regularly. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think what we probably ought to do is uh, uh, move forward with uh, a process. We don't have to have a motion, but I think we probably ought to move forward with a process with Mike, uh, uh, potentially include the folks with MDOT uh, for their um, experience and knowledge to move forward with the development of an RFP uh, that we would approve at some point in our future meetings here. This, this consultant wouldn't be in place until construction starts anyway, correct? That's correct. So we have 18 months to, to get it done. if the timeline worked perfectly. Sure. So, but we should probably start that process. If you all agree, agree, we can direct staff just to, to do that. And then once that RFP is developed, we can approve it officially. Sounds, sounds yeah. right. Okay, thanks, Mike. All right, uh, with that, are there any other questions, comments for anyone? Uh, not on the process that we've gone here. It almost goes back to the minutes we approved and the minutes we had mentioned that uh, we would put everything online where it was available or make all the comments available. Uh, uh, do we have a plan for a website to capture all this? Ryan, do you wanna just quickly address that? with us yeah great question yeah. uh, and while Ryan is making his way to the podium uh, I did neglect to go for a vote on the motion you had uh, supported or made the motion to uh, accept the minutes and supported that yeah. motion uh, all those in favor signify by aye. aye opposed thank you Ryan thank you uh, so to respond to the question there is there will be an online repository for information uh, related to um, the tec technical documentation. The, the minutes referred to the um, um, earlier link to the previous uh, simulcast that's mm -hmm. available online and there's a, a um, um, but the state of Michigan has a website for this, uh, for your authority. Good. Um, you're on there. <laughs> so, um, right. but yeah, that content will be, uh, will reside there. All right. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Either one of you? 
Well, with that, why don't we take uh, about a 20-minute break here, um, and then we will come back and uh, take, take our time and go through the public comment process. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to call the meeting back to order. If everybody could just grab their seats. All right, once again, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm going to just run through our public comments, uh, ground rules again. I uh, want, to, want to make sure everyone understands uh, this is not a question and answer period. We are not going to sit here and answer questions for your three minute period. Uh, we'll take any comments you have under advisement. All comments, uh, whether folks submit them online, uh, send in uh, snail mail, uh, we do gather those and they are uh, shared with uh, all three of us as commissioners. Um, so uh, ultimately it's a three minute uh, um, timeline here. I'll give you a 15 second uh, notice that your time is, is, is coming up. Um, and, and as Ryan had said, there'll be a public domain um, where public comments will be shared uh, ultimately uh, for the authority. So. Uh, with that, we don't have a big list here today. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there is no sharing of your time with somebody else. Uh, each person gets three minutes, so you don't get three minutes and somebody else defers to you. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, one person to come up to the microphone um, and then the next person to uh, come up uh, and be on deck so that we aren't waiting for folks to walk up uh, throughout this process. So. Um, with that, uh, I would invite Mr. Brent Polarski to come up and Mr. Mike Ripley. Brent will be the first one to present. Um, and uh, bear with me just for one second. I'll get my timer here. And we're good to go, Brent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom, uh, board members. Uh, I'm Brent Polarski, representative of Lyuna uh, for the state of Michigan. Uh, I represent roughly 11,000 hard-working men and women in the construction industry. Uh, I'd like to speak to, uh, if it's Commissioner Richardson's question, regarding Michigan labor, right? So we have been partnering and talking with Enbridge throughout the process, communicating to them uh, uh, how we want to work with them on bringing well-trained, skilled labor to this project so that it's done safely and on time. First off, we have four training centers throughout the state of Michigan. With that, we have the highest skilled, best trained workforce in Michigan, and we are willing and ready to build this project. I think it's important for the commissioners to understand the due diligence that Enbridge is working on. Amber, I thought, you know, it's apropos, it's Women in Construction Week, and you're here presenting. So kudos to you. Um, uh, uh, not only that, the contractor they selected, Michigan-based, is a signatory contractor with the laborers and the operating engineers in this state. So currently, there is no labor issue, and the labor issues that we are going to have is building this tunnel quickly, efficiently, as and safely as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Good morning. My name is Mike Ripley. I'm the environmental coordinator for the Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority. Cora in Sault Ste. Marie, which is composed of five Native American tribes in the 1836 treaty area, which um, 
The Straits of Mackinac is the very heart of, uh, of our treaty area and is the most productive um, fishery um, area of our fishery. Um, in December of 2017, I shared with you a large amount of information on that fishery and the opposition of the Cora tribes to this tunnel and also to committed to removing line five and decommissioning from Superior to Sarnia, the whole um, pipeline. Um, we believe that that is the only way that we can protect our, our treaty fishery from this aging pipeline. And, um, and I can assure you that the tribes, the five Cora tribes are still committed to that. And uh, all 12 uh, Native American tribes in Michigan have uh, filed resolutions um, calling for removal of line five. It's time for us to move away from fossil fuels. Um, this will commit us to, you know, many, many more years of, of using fossil fuels. We, we all need to move off of fossil fuels now. And we want this pipeline removed. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'm sorry, I didn't do my job well enough. Uh, next up is Mark Clymer. And then on deck is Sean McBreath, McBurthy, McBurdy, Mark. First off, they told me out there that you were just going to read my comments because oh. I gave them a, a written deal, but I took a photo of it so I can uh, rehash it here, I think. So the first question I had was um, the liability associated with the construction of the tunnel and the long-term operation of it. My understanding is that it's only a subsidiary of the parent Enbridge that's putting money on the line and there's no bond involved in actually securing any type of liability protection for the people of Michigan. Uh, the second item is what <coughs> costs are the state of Michigan going to assume throughout this process that the people are paying for versus what Enbridge is paying for? And I know there's, um, what I hear is the intent of this authority to make sure that Enbridge you know, incurs all the costs, but uh, I would like to see some type of uh, public audit you know, as this goes on and make it available without people having to go through the FOIA process you mentioned transparency, so that would be one suggestion on transparency that would might make people feel a little more comfortable. And then lastly, during the drilling operation itself, there's going to be a lot of vibration at subterranean levels, and I'm wondering if Enbridge or any of the companies working with them have modeled what impact that might have on adjacent structures like the Mackinac Bridge or the existing tunnel. Is there like a resonant frequency they could hit and the Mackinac Bridge might go down, tunnel might rupture? Just curious. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, Sean McBreedy? It's almost St. Patrick's Day. Work on those pronunciations. Yeah. Uh, Sean McBreedy with Oil and Water Don't Mix. Thanks for having me today. Um, so uh, I want to focus in on a couple things and then there's a letter I'm going to be submitting on behalf of the steering committee of oil and water don't mix consisting of citizen and tribal organizations from across the state of Michigan. Two points I'd like to make with you verbally today. First, uh, that back when this tunnel scheme was hatched, uh, Governor Snyder um, identified that the taxpayers of Michigan will benefit from this project but won't have to pay for it. Uh, one of the ongoing promises here is that the taxpayers won't have to pay. Uh, unfortunately, that promise has already been broken. Um, the legislature appropriated $4.5 million uh, to go into this Straits Corridor Authority, um, which is money that is being spent, obviously, looking for um, an oil tunnel that we don't need through the heart of the Great Lakes. Um, now, that $4.5 billion, or $4.5 million, excuse me, is small change compared to the liability risk Michigan taxpayers face. 
Um, a report uh, by, this, uh, by American Risk Management Resources Network uh, called an analysis of the Enbridge Financial Assurances Report, which the state of Michigan commissioned, um, identifies several problems with the Enbridge-Snyder Agreement that we recommend this board rectify before moving forward uh, with any sort of tunnel plans or permitting. First of all, it looked uh, in Enbridge's pledge that the company has $1.878 billion to cover cleanup costs of a Line 5 spill. Uh, problem being that Enbridge subsidiaries signed that agreement. Enbridge Inc.'s assets were used, um, uh, the parent company's assets were used. And Enbridge's corporate structure is such that it could avoid liability because the agreement was signed by the subsidiaries and the company's assets controlled by the parent company. The parent company is not responsible for liabilities incurred by its subsidiaries, uh, and heads of subsidiaries are on record saying so. Um, an examination of company records and statements indicates that the parent company's responsibility to cover cleanup costs would be purely voluntary. Um, Enbridge wants us to trust them about covering damages from a Line 5 rupture. They cite federal law that claims that taxpayers would not be on the hook, but the law that they cite, the Oil Pollution Cleanup Act of 1990, um, demonstrates that, or, uh, according to that law, the uh, liability would be capped at $350 million. The worst case damages from a Michigan State University study to Michigan and the economy in Michigan uh, are over $45 billion. Uh, so that $1.8 billion financial assurances number should be reevaluated. And further, the state should be requiring an actual insurance policy specifically on Line 5 um, with the state named as a co-insured to ensure that the state can be made whole in the event of a pipeline rupture. This gives no timetable for building um, this uh, supposed oil tunnel through the Great Lakes, and the state is liable and on the hook. Uh, taxpayers are on the hook for an oil spill from those existing pipelines at this point in time. And this board really needs to rectify that before moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Up next. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Up next, uh, Shally, uh, Ashley Soltistak. Very Polish. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry, oh. Ashley. And up next, Lawrence Welsh. All right, great. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Ashley Sotishek. Um, I'm the Watershed Policy and Program Coordinator for Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide comments this afternoon. Uh, Tip of the Mick Watershed Council is a nonprofit organization based here in northern Michigan whose purpose is to protect, restore, and enhance water resources, including our Great Lakes, Inland Lakes, rivers, wetlands, and groundwater. We base all of our programs on sound science and policy analysis and have garnered respect for our work from local, state, and federal agencies as well as businesses, fellow environmental organizations, and citizens. We have written comments that we've already submitted for the record today, so I'm only going to highlight some of our main points this afternoon. First, the constitutionality of PA 359 and subsequently the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority is still under question and may yet be declared void by the court system. Therefore, it would be prudent for the authority to not take actions pursuant to PA 359 or any agreements related to PA 359. We recommend that the authority refrain from taking any actions and making any decisions that could be declared unconstitutional by the Michigan Court of Appeals. Second, once the validity of the authority is determined, we recommend that the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority require Enbridge to obtain a permit under the Michigan Great Lakes Submerged Lands Act, Part 325 of the Michigan Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act. The Great Lakes Submerged Land Act requires that any use of Great Lakes bottomlands to prove that it will neither substantially affect the public use or public interests of the state. In addition, we request that the authority require Enbridge to submit a full environmental impact statement to the Michigan Public Service Commission. The EIS will allow Enbridge to provide the reason for proposing the Straits Tunnel Project and what the expected results are, consideration of a reasonable range of alternatives that can accomplish the purpose and need of proposed action, the environment to be affected by the alternatives under consideration, and the direct and indirect environmental effects and their significance. Third, the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority needs to ensure that no taxpayer dollars go toward the proposed Straits of Mackinac Tunnel project and that Enbridge fully funds all expenditures. 
This includes providing the authority with the funds to retain technical expertise to monitor the construction of the tunnel, as well as allowing all state agencies adequate expertise to evaluate the tunnel proposal through permit applications. Fourth, given the public interest and high consequence should an incident occur in the construction of the tunnel or operation of a crude oil pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac, the authority should strive for the utmost public transparency. This includes making public all documents that Enbridge has submitted for public review. Finally, we recommend that the authority look at Line 5 holistically and at the entire pipeline infrastructure in Michigan. The four miles in the Straits of Mackinac cannot be separated from the rest of the infrastructure that also poses a risk to Michigan's environment and citizens' public health and safety. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Ashley. All right, Lawrence. Up next, Bill Ganaki. Let's start off by saying there was a pipe that was left on the Straits floor last fall, and we were lied to about it. We were lied about the fact that it was there, we were lied about the length of it, and we were lied to about how close it was to Line 5. Talk to Sector 7 commanders in the Sioux. The Coast Guards indicates to me that if there's an oil spill, the Port of Chicago and the Port of Milwaukee will both be closed, as shipping will not be able to transfer transit and oil spill area was also told that it's quite possible that the Sioux locks would be closed which means the only steel that's being made in this country down in Pittsburgh coming out of Duluth would be blocked Mackinac Island it'd be historic all right because nobody'd be able to get there unless you flew there in a plane this entire marina of ships that's down here if there's oil in there you can't even take the ships out to clean them to move them to somewhere else because of the regulations. And you can't leave the straits with them because you'll spread the oil. It's approximately 22 to 24,000 jobs that are here in the, the area that depend on the Great Lakes. Um, is there any plan like maybe a million dollar or billion dollar bond to cover them because the loss of wages would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $720 million in just one season? Uh, they have an evacuation plan for Mackinac Island. Imagine trying to get all those people off in four hours on the 4th of July. Where will the crap that's coming out of the bottom that's made from this tunnel, which northern Michigan county will be left with this pile of crap that comes out of there? Nobody's talked about that either. And I understand from talking to an engineer in West Germany that it would be at least 55 Olympic-sized swimming pools of crap that would come out that would be dumped on some county. No new permits should be allowed for anything until we see what that pipe looks like down there. Um, I hear there's a little bit of wavering on whether or not they'll close the old line. The old line's going to get closed. You can close it or we can close it. Just like up in Canada. So they're going to start work in 2021. Where are they putting the tunnel in? Have you asked that question? Have you asked the physical space it's going in? Their power plant here is only 10 inches above Lake Michigan water levels right now. There's a good chance that the power, power plant won't be there if the water levels keep going up. What happens to the current oil pumping station then when they have no electricity? $1 billion, that will cover the people, I'm sure. You say you don't want to uh, maybe remove that line. I guess not, because a marathon engineer told me that nobody's ever removed an oil line like that under the water before. You can't clean it, and when you cut it with the metal, t metal w t cutting tools, it will leak oil. You're going to leak oil, Embridge. Thank you, Lawrence. Up next, Bill Ganaki. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Gennadke. I live down in Charlevoix. I've got three comments. The first is, in uh, Public Act 359, which is your authorization, it states in uh, Section 14C sub, or 14D, Subsection 2, the Corridor Authority Board shall provide a report to the Mackinac Bridge Authority and the Director of the State Trans uh, Transportation Department at least one time per year regarding aspects of the utility tunnel that could affect the Mackinac Bridge Authority, including but not limited to the progress of construction and utility leasing. And I've tried to get a hold of that, and uh, people down there tell me it hasn't been filed yet. If I'm in error, I, I stand to be corrected. If it uh, hasn't, I would encourage you to uh, file that report. The second is we were told last year 
that uh, Enbridge would pay for everything. Uh, yet there was an appropriation of 4.5 million that is, uh, as I understand it, going to verify the certification of facts on the tunnel. Now that's a taxpayer subsidization of the process in conflict with the statement made last year. I live in a small township of 723 people. Uh, we figured it out down there that when somebody applies for a permit to build or to get a, a special use permit, that there's an application fee. Now, I'm not aware if there was an application fee filed yet by Enbridge or not, but what our uh, statutes say is the Planning Commission or Zoning Board of Appeals, if it determines the basic fee which they file, will not cover the actual costs of the application, review, or appeal of the Zoning Board of Appeals, determines the review of the application or participation in the review process or appeal by qual qualified planners, engineers, attorneys, or other professionals is necessary, then the applicant shall deposit with the township treasurer such additional zoning fees in an amount determined by the planning commission equal to the estimated additional cost. And as a taxpayer of the state of Michigan, I would like to see something like that set up here, and I would encourage the um, uh, authority to work toward that. That in fact, when Enbridge, if they apply, and I'm sure they will, uh, for the construction of this, the verification should not be subsidized by the taxpayers, but should be subsidized by the applicant. And that would be consistent with the, ter uh, the uh, terms that were thrown around in uh, 2018 in November and December when this uh, 1197 was being considered and ultimately passed that the taxpayers wouldn't pay for anything. So I would encourage you to work for that. Third, I would hope that the Tunnel Authority would work to do something about the transfer of this tunnel if it is built to the Tunnel Authority. The Tunnel Authority will pay no taxes. And I don't understand why it's incumbent upon the taxpayers of the state of Michigan to subsidize a foreign for-profit corporation. Now I understand that Enbridge pays a lot of taxes in the state of Michigan. And I appreciate that, as I'm sure do the local school districts and units of government. But this is a 350 to 500 million, if you believe those numbers, and I think that's low, expenditure. Fermi in Monroe, Cook in Bridgman, Palisades in South Haven, and even uh, the little former nuclear plant down in Charlevoix, next to where I live, all pay property taxes. And I would encourage the authority to work towards such an effect for this tunnel if it is ever built. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. So uh, that is all of the cards that we received. Is there anyone, uh, did, we, did we check one last time to make sure there weren't any more out there? Okay. We appreciate all the comments that have been made today understand that uh, people are on uh, all sides of this. Some great points were brought up today that uh, I'm sure uh, staff has taken down notes. Uh, we will consider those and take those under advisement. Uh, we'll consider those uh, ideas and comments in, in future meetings and in our dialogue with staff. So with that, I would ask for an adjournment, uh, a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you all for coming. Take care, drive careful.